Welcome back to the Flex Diet Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Mike T. Nelson. And on this podcast, we talk about all things to improve your performance in the gym, add more muscle, and improve your body composition, and do all of it without destroying your health in a flexible way or method. Today on the podcast, I've got my buddy, Evan Pycon. And we're talking all about his new device, the company he works for now, called Knox. This is a really cool device. As of the time of this recording, I have not yet had a chance to use it, but it's definitely on my list to play around with. I have used metabolic cards before. I do have a Moxie set up here also, so I'm somewhat familiar with the technology. But with this new device, what they're able to do is to measure nitric oxide in real time. You also get muscle oxygenation and oxygen consumption in addition to some other measurements. If all that sounds like Greek to you, Evan walks us through why these measurements are useful, how you can use the data, and even if you don't have any plans of adding any technology to your training, we review a lot of solid training principles that I think once you understand them will definitely help you program better for yourself and for your clients. Evan is just a wealth of legitimate, hardcore physiology knowledge, so it's always wonderful to chat with him. And if you enjoy this geeky chat here and you want more information, make sure to check out my newsletter. Go to MikeTNelson.com for all the information there. You can hop onto the newsletter for free. We'll even give you a free gift. I go to MikeTNelson.com, and most of the writing I have and content goes out exclusively to the Fitness Insider newsletter there, and it is free to join, and if for some odd reason you don't like it, you can unsubscribe at any point. We will miss you, but totally understand. So enjoy this hardcore physiology conversation about nitric oxide, muscle oxygenation, how to maximize your performance both in the gym and for your sport with the one and only Evan Pycon. Hey, welcome back to the Flex Diet Podcast. And today we're here with Evan Pycon. How's it going, man? It's going great. How are you? Good. Thank you so much for being on the podcast here. I know we've chatted off and on over the years and very nice to see you here. Thank you for your time. Yeah, of course. Thanks for having me on. And I think we we're just talking before we started that you've got a new, I guess, would you consider it a wearable or a new physiologic measuring device? Sounds a little bit better. Wearables, I feel, is brought with all sorts of landmines these days. Yeah. <laughs> we call it a wearable just because colloquially that's what sure. the hearing. But yeah, that really you're hitting on one of the main reasons why we ended up developing this device in the first place, which is that we're just generally unsatisfied with the wearables that were available prior. Yeah. So what was the issue with wearables you were looking to resolve? Yeah. So to me, it's really two things. One is you look at the bulk of wearables on the market and they all effectively measure the same three to five different things. You got heart rate, you have blood oxygenation, you have HRV and various derivatives of that. And those things are all great, but they've existed for a long time. And I'm like you, I'm always looking for the next big thing, always trying to explore physiology and performance in a little bit more of a nuanced way. And there's just so much you could get from heart rate and blood oxygenation, the same things that we've been looking at forever. So that was definitely one of them. The other was that we wanted to measure things that have a little bit more of a transformative impact on health or performance. So again, going beyond the same few things that every wearable captures, competing on things besides form factor. You look at Apple Watch, Whoop, or Ring, say measurements, different way of strapping it to your body or interfacing with that data in an app. So that was really the starting point. And then from there, it was a matter of figuring out what do we actually want to measure with this thing? And then that's a whole two years of my life working <laughs> on that. How did you go through that process? I think it'd be interesting because I think for a lot of people, what I see is that, oh, we have this new, like the history of HRV, right? Which you're very familiar with. Initially, it was when I was doing my PhD, one of my topics is HRV. 
we had 10 grand worth of used lab equipment. I had to freaking write a MATLAB code to translate most of it. Thank God Kubios had just come on the market so I could upload raw RRs in there. So I didn't have to do all the analysis per se. Fast forward, I think it was one of the first companies that said, hey, you can just use a heart rate strap in your phone mm -hmm. and get it. And now you can, HRV is being thrown on to everything for better or worse. And I've lost a couple of contracts because they're like, hey, we want you to help consult for HRV thing. I'm like, okay, let's do initial mm -hmm. thing. I said, hey, what's your idea? I'm like, that was a stupid idea. Like, why would you ever do that? You have, let's measure yeah. HRV 24 hours a day. I'm like, you have no context. What if they're exercising? What if they're running yeah. to the bus? What if, and they're going to look and go, oh my God, it says I'm very sympathetic and they're going to yeah. lose their shit. Or so better yet, randomly sampling throughout the day, just getting yeah. data points day to day, different times a day and trying to compare them. It's crazy. Yeah, and they're not, a lot of times they're not validated there's no gauge r and r and then they get mad at me and then they i never talk to them again but it seems like the general trend is we have this technology let's just try to put it in everything and it sounds like you're doing the opposite of hey what do we actually want to know what are things we should be looking for and then let's maybe go look at some other technologies instead of trying to shoehorn existing technology into every little device known to man yeah, it was very much working backward from the endpoint. So what are the endpoints that we're looking for? One, I want a better way to personalize strength and conditioning. We all know mm. a lot of inter-individual or You mean we're not all the same? Apparently not. <laughs> but yeah, everyone knows this. Obviously, inter-individual responses are a huge thing. It's the reason why 10 people could do a CrossFit group class and one guy ends up going to the games two years later and everyone else may not progress. There's not a lot of great ways to predict who's going to be the one that adapts and thrives and who isn't, though. Another one, this one is near and dear to me, working with CrossFit athletes for a number of years, is load management. It's just a nightmare with mixed sports. If you have oh. runners, it's pretty straightforward. How many miles are you running per week? Yeah. What are the speeds? If you're a weightlifter, same thing. It's pretty straightforward. If you're a CrossFit athlete, how do you equate volume between squats and wall balls and running and assault biking? I have no idea. I really never figured that out, even when I was coaching top cross games competitors. So that was one that re we really wanted to try and solve. And then a third one was being able to track progress over time and do it in an easy way. So like yourself, I've gone on the deep end with a lot of technologies. Some are great lab grade pieces of tech, but user interfaces, not fantastic. So yeah. I'm Moxie not device early on. Yeah, exactly. I told Roger this to to him, so it's not like a big secret. And they are getting so much better with it, thank God. But yeah, mm -hmm. the early stuff was just like, what do you, I need another computer? I need what to put on this thing? I need to drag my computer out to my garage. Say, well, what are you doing? Yeah, I, I yeah. originally learned how to code solely to be able to automate my analysis for all of these technologies. So yeah. if it's easier to spend six months learning to code <laughs> than to data, yeah, interface may suck. <laughs> really telling you something. Yeah, that's where we started. Muscle oxygenation was one of the first things that we thought about that. And I think there's something to that measurement for solving these different problems. Yeah. But we couldn't really stop there because one of the big problems with the interpretation of muscle oxygenation is that you don't have blood flow. A lot of people in the nearest community, they say THB, which is total hemoglobin. It's a measure of blood volume. They'll say that's blood flow or they'll say, just look at the change in THB. And you could interpret that as blood flow. Definitely can't do that. If you ever take a Doppler ultrasound and compare the actual blood flow measurement with the THB measurement on something like a Moxie, very weakly correlated. So clearly that THB signal is in blood flow. So one of the things that we wanted to do is say, what regulates blood flow in the microvasculature? Turns out the molecule that does that is a form of nitric oxide that rides on the red blood cell and is released in response to deoxygenation. The real full and long name for that molecule is s nitrosohemoglobin or SNO hemoglobin for short. Hmm. I just call that active nitric oxide because it's a little bit of a mouthful. So we want to see, could we measure this? Because it's never been measured non-invasively. And there's only about three labs in the U.S. to the best of my knowledge that can make that measurement. In ballparking off the top of my head, I believe it costs about 250 grand to make that measurement in blood. Oof. So we're like, could we do that non-invasively on the cheap and in real time? We spent a really long time working on that, but we eventually got to that point. 
And then that allowed us to unlock another series of measurements. Once you could measure active nitric oxide, you could measure a lot of other things as well, like oxygen consumption in the tissue or the amount of metabolic works that a tissue does. And those were the main things that we started with on the Knox wearable because it's a small device. Technology is rapidly getting better. We just tacked a lot of fun extras into there too, like skin temperature accelerometry and just start packing measurements in. So that's how we ended up where we are today. Very cool. And to back up a little bit. So one of the things I noticed on Moxie, which I do, I have a three setup Moxie mm -hmm. system. I think it's useful. But the blood flow thing always bothered me a little bit and critics, rightfully so, of that technology would say that well, you're not really measuring blood flow. You're measuring this at best, this quote, surrogate kind of marker. And you would see a change, right? So you can play with partial vascular occlusion, like so blood flow mm -hmm. restriction, where you're purposely just physically changing blood flow to high rep, horrible sets where the muscles contracting so much, you're probably getting some occlusion of the vessels and you would, at least I would see some changes in it, but over time, I just threw that measurement out because I didn't know what to do with it other than seeing it kind of change within a session. Mm -hmm. I had a harder time using it sort of session to session. And I ended up just looking at SMO2. Okay. For me, if I'm doing something, I'm warmed up 85, 86 is a max I can ever get to. So if I walk in cold, I'm at 70. Probably need to do a little bit more of a warm up, right? I want to get to the highest value I can get before I start depleting it. And then you can play around with, okay, how far do I want to go down and deplete it depending upon the intensity of exercise. So that's how I ended up using it, which maybe is a little bit crude. So I don't know what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, I, I think for the total hemoglobin, I'm definitely more in the same camp as you. It's actually something we debated if we want to even display that when people use the Nox mm. We decided. No, we're not even going to. Okay. <laughs> and it's for the reason that you mentioned it. You could look at it. You could see these trends over the course of a workout. And when you take a really simple interpretation of it, I definitely used to be much more in like the Jörg Feldman camp. So people that know Niers and have used Moxie will know who Jörg is. Really awesome sports scientist that frankly contributed a ton to the interpretation of these types of measurements. But one of the things that Jörg talked about, this is maybe 10 years ago is that you can look at the THB signal and use that to infer whether someone is compressing the tissue, getting venous occlusion or arterial occlusion. And I was definitely in that camp as well. I've taught that in courses in the past. And after spending a lot more time with those measurements, I realized you absolutely cannot do that. So mm. mechanical factors do impact that total hemoglobin measurement, but there are also metabolic factors that impact it like hypoxic vasodilation. There are also neurological factors that impact it, like sympathetic vasoconstriction. So you have these three competing forces that are all impacting that THB measurement at any given time. And you have no way of knowing which of those is actually impacting the measurement. So in terms of interpreting it, you could have a response where SMO2 goes down and THB goes up and people would say that's venous occlusion. Or it's hypoxic vasodilation. Both of them would look exactly <laughs> that way. Or you could say it's a muscle compression, or it could be sympathetic vasoconstriction. We have no idea, but theoretically, the THB response will look the same in both of those instances. So that's why I ended up just throwing that signal away and really focusing on muscle oxygenation for a number of years, because that is a little bit more of a straightforward measurement. Is it going up? Is it going down? Or is it flatlining? And based on which of those three, oxygen supply is either greater than demand, less than demand, or equal. So... That's where I think having some of these other measurements does add a lot to the interpretation. You could start to triangulate and then go beyond just knowing what the supply and demand situation is. Yeah. And for listeners, like a lot of these measurements are not super easy. So part of my PhD that never, I published part of it in an energy drink study was looking at FMD, right? So flow mediated dilation. So we'd have people come into the lab, we would take a blood pressure cuff, we would occlude around their forearm, mm -hmm. take literally an ultrasound probe stick it on their upper arm, try to find one of the main vessels there. So you're trying to directly image this vessel, which is horrible because you're trying to hold this thing exactly where it is. And we got this arm apparatus and stuff. And the person's sitting there with their arm going numb. And you hit a little button and it allows all the cuff to release. So you have all the blood flow that comes in. So you see with the shear stress across the vessel wall, which causes all these local changes, which we'll talk about. And the vessel would dilate a different amount. 
It sounds great. And in theory, there's tons of data to support it. But when you actually do the measurement itself, I realized, man, this thing is touchy as hell, even under the best circumstance, because you're imaging a vessel from the side and the imaging technology has definitely gotten a lot better, but you have to figure out where exactly is the vessel wall and where is the blood flow. And a lot of times you're grabbing these kind of static pictures in order to do the post analysis. So I got really pissed off one day and I went in there and there's an algorithm that'll put in the vessel wall for you. And some of the images I had were borderline. We ended up throwing them out, not using some of them, which dropped the power of the study. But I went in and played around with, I think the wall is here. I think it's a little bit there. Mm -hmm. And I ran the analysis both ways. And it was like really different. I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> because you think you're accurate when you're doing it. And I realized that, oh, man, like if I don't have a really nice, clear image, I don't trust any of that data at all. And I got lucky that most images I had when we did the post-processing were good enough. But I had a few that I ended up just throwing out because I'm like, I'd ran it. I think it could be here or here. And the results were like statistically significantly different. So all that to say that even when you've got direct imaging sometimes and the ultrasound we had was like $120,000. It wasn't like a cheap one per se. Yeah. Even with direct imaging, it's not as sometimes as clear forward as what you would think that it is. And the mistake I had was reading a lot of these papers. It's described really well, but when you actually go and you try to do some of these measurements, it's a lot messier than what people realize. Yeah, I've played around that. I've done some voluntary occlusion, plethysmography, and yeah, you don't realize how even like sneezing could just blow. Oh, that'll fuck everything up. As, like, <laughs> yeah. On that testing, they'll put students literally with their arm in like a vice in two yep. spots, holding them down so they can't move a muscle. Yep. You just twitch and the whole analysis is shot. You can't even repeat it in the same day because you'll nope. wash out the effects. So yeah, it's... It, it's hard even working with those really high end lab grade pieces of equipment for sure. So when you're doing non-invasive, how do you get around some of that stuff? Because you're strapping a device onto the outside of the muscle and you're expecting it to do stuff under movement, right? You're looking at stuff under exercise. I don't know if you just want to talk a little bit about how do you know you're getting a decent signal? How do you try to get rid of some of the noise and does that kind of determine what you can physically even use and end up putting in the final device. Yeah, totally. Yeah. One of the things that we learned early on is there's a lot of signal that you wouldn't expect to be in the muscle. So I remember hmm. three years ago, I was guinea pig number one with most of these technologies. <laughs> and I was supposed to just be doing like a baseline sitting resting measurement. So I took a measurement with a really early prototype of the Knox device. This thing looked like a Game Boy Color, like strapped to my leg. It was <laughs> and to one of our engineers. He was like, are you like flexing your muscle like 15 times a minute or something? And I was like, no, I'm not moving, I'm not doing anything. Realized well, I wonder if it's for Venus return. I was measuring my respiratory rate through my leg. Was really? They could pick that up. With me and my calf. So we're like, huh, that's a weird thing. <laughs> Didn't know you could get that through a leg muscle because you're essentially getting a pulsing of the artery. So there's that in the oh, yeah. muscle. When you move, obviously the muscle fluctures, compressing the blood vessels under the sensor. So we're getting that. One of the things that ended up really helping is having a really fast measurement speed. It's so, like a high sampling rate per se. Yeah, or? At one point, we are sampling up to 200 times a second. So you're seeing everything going on. If the muscle contracts, you could see the changes. What ended up being great for us is rather than that being something that we're trying to filter out the movement, that ended up being a feature and not a bug. And I say that is, for example, with muscle oxygenation, if you're measuring it in the tissue, if you're compressing the muscle, let's say you're on a salt bike and you're riding at 100 RPM, so 100 muscle contractions per minute. You could actually see the signal changing with each individual muscle contraction. Hmm. Squeeze in muscle. Instead of a lot of people, if you use a moxie, you're used to you sprint on a bike and muscle oxygenation steadily goes down and then you stop right. and it really comes up. Realize that is not what the signal looks like when you're getting it in full speed. Instead, Oh, because that's an averaged out signal, right? So you're not average. seeing the up and down. You're just seeing the mm -hmm. average, so to speak. Exactly. So we would see like a complete zigzag where with 
a given muscle contraction, you might drop oxygen down to 20%, and then between contractions, reoxygenate up to 60%, and it would be zigzagging back and forth. So you have a micro trend, what's happening on a muscle contraction by muscle contraction basis, then a macro trend, what's happening over the course of 10, 20, 200 muscle contractions. So the speed ended up being something that worked in our favor in that regard. And then in terms of movement artifacts, that's always going to be an issue even at rest. Again, ended up not really being a big deal. It didn't impact the quality of the measurements. And we do have accelerometers within the device so we could correct for that as well if we had to. So that micro movement then, is that something that I'm hypothesizing here would be useful? So let's say you, you put someone on a salt bike, you tell them to do, I don't know, do 200 watts, right? Just a continuous exercise thing. And you're seeing between muscle contractions, someone who, lack of a better word, desats all the way down to 15, but then only goes up to 50 versus mm-hmm. someone else who desats to 15, goes back to 70 versus mm-hmm. someone who goes from 40 to 20. I think you would probably infer that those, even though they're doing the same output, they're doing 200 watts, that maybe those three people are different profiles then? Yeah, and if you were to take like a smoothed out trend for those three people, the smoothed out version might actually look the same in those three cases. That was my next question. Yeah, so <laughs> Does the micro like, match the macro? Yeah, so we have seen that where the smoothed out version could look very similar for two different people, but the very high sampling version could look different because they have a different dynamic range of the signal. What does that mean exactly in practice? Yeah. I don't exactly know yet. That's going to be one of the things that's fun about getting this technology into more people's hands because we're early stage startup, small team. There's only so much that you could investigate. Yeah, totally. Things that I'm really curious about is one of those better than the other. We don't have enough data to say which of those is more common in a very high level athlete versus maybe an intermediate or beginner athlete. I don't know what the answer to that question is. I don't know if that's a trainable quality. I suspect some of it has to do with the force of contraction. So maybe how sure. well coordinated this person, are they over contracting relative to the effort? Or are they able to have a nice rhythmic contraction where they're not squeezing the muscle any harder than they need to? It's like when you see someone on a rower who's not very well coordinated, maybe they come from a strength sport background and they're rowing like a two minute 500 split. And you're like, it looks like you're deadlifting 400 pounds. What's <laughs> happening? The stroke there? rate's 15. <laughs> yeah. And you watch someone that, you know, they're good at rowing. So it's a very fluid movement and you can tell it's a relatively soft contraction with each one. I think that might be some of it, but time will tell. Yeah. It's one tip on rowing I've been trying to work on is that smooth is fast because you look at like elite level rowers do crazy shit and and there's a wide variety of ways they start and stop but to me the craziest ones literally it's go maybe they do two hard pulls and then if you watched them at minute one versus minute five you can't tell any damn difference yeah and at the end they don't even look like they're that fatigued until you look at their face and they look like they want to vomit over in the corner yeah. If you watched him doing the thing, you're like, I don't know. I don't think he's trying that hard. Yeah. But then again, that's what all elite level athletes do. Usain Bolt runs a world record and he finishes. He doesn't look that tired. <laughs> yeah, and it's funny. You go to an elite marathon as well and you'd get Kogi getting ready to cross yeah. the line and you're like, he looks Did like- he start? <laughs> yeah, you're like, maybe he looks like he's a little tired, but like, he's smiling, doesn't look like he's in that much pain. But then he crosses the finish line and you see them crumble and you're like, Oh, okay. That's interesting. (laughs) Yeah, which makes me think that if you have a good enough measurement, can you look at the data and once you know what a pattern of more efficiency is, if you just display that data, could someone kind of auto-correct themselves to be more efficient? So with rowing, one thing I do is, okay, once you get to whatever your rate is, I want you to hold this average rate and try not to vary that much. And once they can do that, then I'm like, okay, can you do that with less effort? And they mm-hmm. always look at you like, what the hell's wrong with you? Can you make it look easier? But I want you to hold the same output. And they just give you this. I'm like, just try it. And yeah. most of the time over practice, they can get it. Even though I didn't give them a cue of push more through your foot or put whatever. I didn't give them any technical cues. It's almost like an external cue that their brain can try to figure out how to solve that problem. Yeah, I absolutely think that's 
a feasible quality. I've used muscle oxygenation and things like that for feedback as well, less with mechanical right. and technical cues, more with controlling breathing, maybe adjusting yes. posture and position. And what most people will see is you could figure out how to manipulate your breathing and posture. Keep in mind, it doesn't mean just nasal breathing the whole time when you're trying to. What? You're not supposed to, you can't nasal breathe for a I max guess. 2K test? What? Oh man. Yeah, we're going to get in trouble for that one. Uh. But yeah, you could figure out the proper breathing patterns, proper posture, and you could see one, you could actually change the relationship between oxygen supply and demand in the tissue based on doing those things. And also it generally feels easier. It's almost like doing the opposite of bodybuilding. You could do a bicep right. curl with 30 pounds and you could say, oh, this is pretty easy. I could make this even easier if I slightly change my hand position. I change the way that I'm breathing through the rep. Or you could say, I could make this as hard as possible by changing my hand positioning and breathing and shoulder angle. And one of those is better for hypertrophy. One of those is better if you were doing CrossFit, for example, not that they're competing in bicep curls, but the same general idea applies to other exercises. And I think you could take that same concept and layer it onto really any activity, whether you're rowing, biking, you name it. Yeah. And one of the key I've been working on, I don't have enough data on this and I need to play around with the moxie a little bit more to see if it can pick it up based off of listening to some of your lectures and stuff too that I'm like okay so if I'm doing a somewhat all out max let's just stick with the rower I've got devices on my quad yes how much you can force you can put into it because you're pulling against the flywheel matters but then I also realized by looking at some other data from some other people that have been here and their vo2 data and stuff how fast you can get that muscle to relax yeah. in between each contraction, I think makes a huge difference for efficiency. And you've seen probably some of that. I don't remember what Russian researcher, I was talking to Cal Dietz about this, that showed with their elite level athletes, it wasn't the speed of the contraction that was different. It was the speed of how fast they could get the muscle to relax. Yeah. And so I tried to do some techniques on the rower where, Again, I would try to hold the same wattage, but when I'm just simple terms, bringing the handle back, the muscles quote unquote relaxed, the cue I gave myself was literally just relax. So it was like, go relax. Yeah. Anecdotally, again, I don't have a ton of data on this. It, my RPE of that session, even though it was harder mentally, was actually better for the same wattage. So in theory, if you could relax the muscle, you could get more blood flow back into it. That second it's relaxed, then in theory, you would have less fatigue as you would go again. Yeah, and that makes a lot of sense. One of the things that I've played around with that for CrossFitters, and again, do I have data on mm -hmm. really doing any of that? No. Yeah. People subjectively said that this feels like it helps them when they go back to their sport. Yes, in some instances, it's the best you're going to get. Is using flywheels for CrossFit athletes. So anyone who's ever used a flywheel, yeah. you know how punishing it is if you can't relax properly. It literally horrible. Like rip your hips off of your femurs or femurs out of your hips if you want <laughs> because if you don't relax properly at the bottom it literally sucks you down into the box so you need to be able to contract with maximal speed relax at the top so it's not a jarring motion pulling you down and then when you get to the bottom of the movement again relax and change direction so if you can learn to exert a lot of force and rhythmically squat on top of a fly box it's much easier to do that when you do a CrossFit Metcon and you're having to relax at the top and bottom of a rep when you're doing wall balls or thrusters or what have you. So one of the things that I found a lot of CrossFitters is one, very tense individuals in many cases that isn't really true at the highest level, but that's very few and far between the people who are very soft and pliable. So most CrossFitters, very tense individuals and also like at intermediate levels of sprinting where people think the way to move faster is to try harder and they yeah. start, start <laughs> more and instead of going faster you just exhaust yourself quicker it's very much the same thing so it's teaching people the kind of like paradox of sprinting where you relax more and you try less in some ways and you go faster and the same thing with crossfit it's trying not trying as hard in some ways to actually move faster and exert yourself less it's kind of a contradictory thing, particularly when part of your sport is trying to get you as strong as possible and you're used to trying to maximally accelerate the bar and using dynamic effort work and things of that nature, which really almost teach you the opposite quality, even breathing patterns, the way to brace under load. It's a very different breathing pattern when you're trying to move a 95 pound barbell 
50 times as fast as possible. Yeah, I always, if people have done golf, I explain it to them, even if, they've, if they're not good at golf at all. I'm like, okay, go out to the driving range and I want you to just try to hit the ball as hard as you possibly can. And then next time, just try to hit it farther. You're probably not going to apply the same amount of quote unquote effort mm -hmm. and let me know which one's better. And everybody knows it's done that. The, if you just try to apply the maximum amount of effort and kill the ball, like it never goes well. It, it's this hybrid between somewhat fast, somewhat relaxed, right? Probably has to do with timing and everything else. Again, you watch any elite level athlete. Like they just, I remember Dr. Cobb saying this years ago, it's like elite level athletes just make hard things look easy. You watch the NFL, you watch a receiver do a pattern, literally turns around and the ball's there, catches it, runs in for a touchdown. It, you're like, ah, I, I look like I could do that. And then you actually, if you've ever trained with any of these individuals, you realize how far statistically away they are yeah. from anything I would ever do. But they make it look so easy. You're like, oh, that looks easy. <laughs> yeah, definitely the case of CrossFit and yeah, NFL players. You don't realize one how big they are and how fast they're huge. They are. You see it in person. I had my mind blown working with some NFL players where I'm like, one, these are literally the biggest people I've ever seen. I didn't know they make humans this large. And also, I feel pathetically slow next to this guy who weighs 320 pounds. Yeah. And to see a guy who weighs over three bills, like move that fast. Like the first time I saw that, I was like, what the fuck is it? Yeah. <laughs> because your perception is a big, huge, muscular guy. And in my head, I'm like, he's, but he's probably not that fast. And then you see him do drills and you're like, what the hell was that? <laughs> yeah. it's, it's freaky to see in person. Yeah. So going back to the device measurements. So it looks like you can measure... I wouldn't say blood flow, but SMO2, is that correct? Is that what you're actually looking at on the device, but just a much higher sampling rate? Yes, yeah, so we measure SMO2, so muscle oxygenation. And then the other biomarkers we measure, one, it's active nitric oxide release from red blood cells. So we call that measurement PNO or personal nitric oxide, but it really is it's snow hemoglobin coming off of the red cell in response to deoxygenation. We also measure local muscle oxygen consumption. So if people are familiar with VO2, that's whole body oxygen consumption. We're measuring what would effectively be like a local muscle VO2. Is that the, you somehow are measuring what's coming in and what's going out or how do you do that? I can't explain. Okay. Yeah. That, <laughs> Proprietary. That's of, yeah. That gets into the IP. Oh, yeah. that's cool. But I could effectively say is it's a local muscle oxygen consumption measurement. So the more you exert yourself, the more oxygen will be consumed in the tissue up to a point. You see very similar kinetics to a VO2 measurement where there's a ceiling. Um, day to day, you will see variations. And within a given session, you could even delineate in terms of VO2-based intensity zones the same way that you could do a VO2 max test and get mm. like a easy, moderate, heavy, severe maximal zone. You could use VO2 for that as well. And then we have a number of other measurements. We have internal training load measurements. We have things like skin temperature and accelerometry. So again, just some of the extra like nice to haves. It's not so good. for the listeners, how would you explain the kind of the VO2 measurement versus SMO2? Because I think for people, they're like, I don't know, they're both looking at oxygen. Like, what's the difference? Yeah, that's a great question. So I would explain SMO2 is a dynamic balance between oxygen supply and demand. So if you see SMO2 going down, that means more oxygen is being utilized than is being consumed. If you see SMO2 going up, more oxygen is being supplied to the tissue than utilized. In a so SMO2 is more, you're using up more than what's actually being supplied, correct? And then UO2, which is a measure of oxygen consumption, it's how much is actually being consumed. So you could have a scenario where ah. SMO2 is completely flatlined. Because oxygen supplied to the tissue is matching demand. SMO2 right. is totally flat, but UO2 could be going up because the total oxygen flux is increasing. It's the difference between you are supplying five units of oxygen and utilizing five versus you're supplying 10 and utilizing 10. SMO2 would be flatlined in both of those cases, but that's actually a different amount of consumption. So that's where having both of those measurements would be useful there different ways of looking at the same system, essentially. So could that be a surrogate for potentially blood flow then maybe? I know that's a loaded question. <laughs> well, 
I'd say in a sense, you could make some comparisons to blood flow. I think if we wanted to think about blood flow, I'd say the personal nitric oxide or PNO measurement would be more similar to blood flow. Yeah, that was my next question of how that plays into it. Yeah, because we're measuring in the microvasculature and active nitric oxide release from red blood cells is the principal regulator of microvascular blood flow. That's true in muscle, it's true in the heart, it's true in the brain. So we're essentially measuring like the key piece of that integrated system. So I wouldn't say that active nitric oxide release, the measurement PNO is blood flow because there are times when those measurements will be not really match up. Yeah. There's also times where they'll be strongly correlated. So they're it's a useful analogy, but that analogy breaks under certain circumstances. Gotcha. And so what is the, for people listening, what is a huge advantage of trying to measure these markers of nitric oxide? Because the thing that always stuck out to me from my anatomy and physiology 101 was that the local control almost always overrides systemic control. To me, it's just fascinating to think about how the body is designed. If you just look at simple uh, sympathetic outputs of, let's say, norepinephrine, right? The norepinephrine is going to go throughout your entire body. It's going to be carried in the bloodstream. But if I'm running from a bear, when it hits muscle, it's going to have a completely different effect than when it actually hits gut tissue. But it's a very cool way of the body saying, ooh, here's this stressor thing that's happening, but we're going to put out this sort of stress signal everywhere because we want to coordinate all these events. But that doesn't mean that the response is going to be the same across all systems. That response could actually be completely 180 degrees different yeah. because the local control at any one point could override that and be like, nope, nope, nope. This is what we're actually trying to do here. Yeah. So that, that always has been super fascinating to me. So that's something that's really interesting about this active nitric oxide is active nitric oxide. It is released in a local tissue, but it's long lasting and active in blood. So it actually stays in the blood and circulates around the body. It does stay. Okay. I thought it was more fast acting, but I was wrong on that. Yep. So this is where we're trying to figure out the proper terminology for getting this information out there. So in the fitness industry, we talk about nitric oxide. Most people know NO explode. Oh. But generally, it's like beetroot, L-citrulline, arginine in less of a direct way. That is what I would call ordinary nitric oxide. So it's actually, there's thousands of forms of nitric oxide in the body. Lots of different ways that they're produced, physiologic effects. So the two most common that we know about is ordinary nitric oxide. And active nitric oxide is really snow hemoglobin. So if anyone's interested in learning more about that molecule specifically, you can look up SNO hyphen HB. So ordinary nitric oxide is released by the endothelial cells in response to stress. So earlier we were talking about flow mediated dilation, Yep. off blood flow to a limb, you release, all of the blood comes rushing back in, it creates sheer stress on the vascular walls and the endothelial cells release ordinary nitric oxide. The same thing happens to a lesser degree during exercise as well. If you squeeze a muscle and contract really hard, you actually cut off your macrovascular blood flow, you release, you create shear stress. That form of nitric oxide, it does increase bulk blood flow, but not oxygen delivery per se. And one of the main effects yeah. is lower blood pressure, and it's also very short lasting in blood. So when that ordinary nitric oxide is released in blood, when a deoxygenated hemoglobin passes that ordinary nitric oxide, it scavenges it. So it sucks it up and it carries it back through the systemic circulation. When that red blood cell containing hemoglobin makes it back to the lungs, what happens is it releases its carbon dioxide, which we breathe off and expels a waste product. And then that hemoglobin picks up another electron and that ordinary nitric oxide unbinds from the heme iron center and hemoglobin and attaches onto a cysteine site. And now it transforms into a S nitrosohemoglobin. Now it's the active form of nitric oxide. Well, then picks up the oxygen, pumped up the heart, and it goes to the rest of the body. So now that little red blood cell with the hemoglobin containing oxygen and active nitric oxide is traveling around the body. And when it comes to a tissue with a low oxygen supply, the red blood cell senses that and it releases the active nitric oxide and oxygen. Oxygen eventually diffuses, makes it into the mitochondria for energy production. But that active nitric oxide signals for the surrounding microvascular blood vessel to dilate, so the capillaries specifically. Now more 
red blood cells make it there. Eventually, the oxygen supply in the tissue is sufficient. So now any red blood cells with active nitric oxide don't release it. So it's very much a supply and demand-based system. If oxygen levels are low, active nitric oxide is released. If they're not, they won't be. Now, oh. nitric oxide that's released in that local tissue ends up staying in the blood, travels throughout the body, and what it eventually does is it dilates the blood vessels in the heart and the brain. So one of the reasons why exercise improves is is that active nitric oxide is a cerebral vasodilator. Now, it's a slightly different mechanism for blood flow regulation in the brain because instead of being a system that responds to low oxygen concentrations like the muscle, instead it's a system that responds to high CO2 levels. But generally, it's the same mechanisms that are at play there. And the really interesting thing is when you have a mouse that is mutated to not carry active nitric oxide in its blood, even when it has totally normal oxygen levels, it can't oxygenate its tissue because that active nitric oxide is also responsible for allowing oxygen to dissociate from the hemoglobin in the red blood cell. So that process is thermodynamically coupled that when the active nitric oxide breaks off of hemoglobin, oxygen breaks off as well. If you don't have that active nitric oxide, hemoglobin has a much higher affinity for oxygen and it's not as easy for the oxygen to come off. It causes a left shift in the dissociation curve. So people with low active nitric oxide may have normal oxygen levels as you would measure them with the pulse oximeter, getting their arterial oxygenation, but they may actually have low oxygen delivery to their tissues. So one of the benefits of being able to measure someone's active nitric oxide levels is, you know, what oxygen supply to tissues looks like. The more active nitric oxide you have, generally the better your health, fitness, and performance. And that's something that you could train to increase over time. And you could also see how it's trending over time to know if your training program is getting that response, if that's something that someone is specifically looking to do. There would be a local tissue oxygenation marker then, so to speak, or a level, correct? Yeah. And that local aspect is really important for a number of reasons, but one is imagine a situation where you tore your ACL a year ago. Yeah. I was just thinking about injuries where you've got less blood flow or if you're comparing, I did, I tried to do this a little bit with Moxie, compare left to right, even at rest Yeah, and at rest, I wasn't able to get some of the best data, but you would see weird shit where one side looked like the oxygen kind of kinetics for lack of a better word, even though I'm bastardizing that were different. And then you talk to them, you're like, oh yeah, I had an injury on this left side and I would do like some manual muscle testing and the right side would test different than the left side. And yeah. you just see some weird shit. <laughs> and one of the reasons for that is, yeah, when people tear their ACL, they always think about you, you tear the tendon or you tear your quadricep muscle. People forget you also tear your blood vessels too. They tear everything. Yeah. You tear everything. It's not <laughs> for the tendon. It's like you said. So typically when people are going through a return to play process, they take a very muscle or tendon centric stance. But they're not thinking about also restoring the blood flow to the tissue. So years back, one of the things that I'd seen with Moxie is seeing these asymmetries that you're talking about between left and right. Yeah. And at the time, I was like, how do we get better data on this? How do we expand this view? So one of the odd things that I started looking into is infrared thermography. The reason that I'd gotten interested in that is I was reading about racehorse physiology. And one of the things that was interesting is they're like, how do you know if a racehorse is injured? It can't tell you. So <laughs> there out ways to work around that problem. And one of the ways that people start figuring out is using infrared thermography to essentially take a heat map of the tissue. And I was like, oh, that looks pretty cool. I bet you could do that in people too. Around that time, the company ThermoHuman was also starting to pick up as well. So I talked to some of the scientists from there, asked them what they were working on, tried to get as much information as I could. So now I went back to, at the time I was working at Training Think Tank, and we would have someone that would have had a previous knee injury and you would see that they would have impaired oxygen utilization in that tissue. Then lo and behold, when you use infrared thermography, you would see like a big blue spot on the tissue, which blue and infrared thermography is generally a colder measurement. So you're like, oh, they have a big hypothermic region in this tissue. You look at their tissue temperature as well, and it's lower. It's because they've impaired blood flow to that muscle. So you see this with the Knox device as well. One, we do have a temperature measurement in the device, but you'll also see that people generally have low active nitric oxide release in tissues that were previously injured, properly rehabbed, 
as the tissue recovers over time, you start to see those asymmetries going away. So that's one of the important components is yes, active nitric oxide is released in the local tissue and it travels systemically. But that localized measurement is important so far as if you imagine a hypothetical world where you only want to exercise one leg each day and you know, you have one leg that was previously injured, the other leg that isn't, and they're doing the same exercise routine, alternating days. In those days that you're working out that leg that was previously injured, it's not going to have as much active nitric oxide release. So there are non-trivial reasons why you really need to rehab tissues properly, aside from the fact that you want to get stronger again and not be in pain. You also need to restore blood flow so you could produce active nitric oxide or any other myokine in that tissue that's going to have a positive health effect. Well, that's super cool. And for fun, I do like to so love reading racehorse physiology because one, most of those people time everything. Two, the horses don't have much placebo. Mm-hmm. And then three, like you said, you can't ask the horse, how do you feel today? What's going on? So you're kind of left with, and most of the people doing that have a lot of money. And yeah, you know, drug testing and all that stuff is usually there for most of it too. So they're trying to find ways around things via performance. And again, it doesn't always translate to humans, but sometimes you come up with, like you were saying, with thermography and some other cool things that are interesting to think about. Yeah. At least from a tool standpoint, yeah, physiology doesn't always transfer, but at least from a tool standpoint of saying, what are some tools that other people are using? And- yeah. I use those too. Sometimes the answer is no, but oftentimes you end up stumbling on some kind of neat stuff. Have you played with just any manual muscle testing to see if the area that had less perfusion, quote unquote, tested weaker? I know I'm going to piss off a whole bunch of scientists by even mentioning manual muscle testing and they're going to send me hate mail again, but. No, I haven't done that specifically because I don't have any experience with that. So I wouldn't know what I'm doing. Yeah, that. One thing I've noticed is again, it's anecdotal is that in general, what I'll notice is that side just, it's almost, I want to say it's shut down from the nervous system, but it just doesn't function as well. And you can even have people do functional tests, right? You can have them do a squat and look at, okay, oh, do you always shift your hips to the right when you do a squat? Oh my God, how did you know? Yeah, Because your left side's weaker. You're putting force into the leg that your brain thinks is stronger. So of course you're going to on a bilateral exercise, you're going to move that direction towards your strong side. So it makes sense there. Yeah. Things like that always make me think of this issue of can someone not do something or will they not do something? Even using the ears, sometimes you'll see if you're doing like bilateral squatting, you're like, oh, your oxygen utilization is completely asymmetrical between sides. Let's say the right side. Yeah. Keep in mind, there's some normal asymmetry, like a 5% difference between sides, probably not meaningful. But if it's like a 35, 40% difference and the sensors are actually in the same spot on each side, you're like, ah, oh, that's a little fishy. So if one side isn't utilizing as well, you're like, are you actually incapable of utilizing in that tissue? I.e. all things being equal, will that tissue not suck down oxygen? Or is it that you will not do it as in you're either protecting that tissue for some reason, you have some kind of faulty movement mechanics. So I think that's another interesting dimension as well of combining these like external measurements or even just visualization looking at an athlete. It's hard to replace a coach with a good eye with some of these internal measurements and being able to combine those to see, well, uh, maybe we know that this athlete is asymmetrical. Is it a local tissue problem? Is it more of a top-down movement coordination problem? And being able to triangulate with that as well, I think that gives coaches a lot of tools for selecting which tactic do I use right now with this person. So I think that's something kind of fun to play around with as well. I don't really coach people one-on-one anymore, but that's something I definitely want to spend more time looking into. Yeah, and you mentioned even about so I've done a fair amount of work on hands-on stuff with intermediate-ish level CrossFit athletes, a couple that were a little bit more highly ranked. And exactly what you said, 90 plus percent of the intermediate level ones are just like, you look at them and you're like, oh, it looks like you're going to do a photo shoot. And you push on the muscle and it's just, it's super tense. But when you do a lot of the testing, it actually paradoxically tests as quote unquote weak mm-hmm. and So my big thing with them was, okay, that when we have you do a motion, can we get the muscle to fire as best that it can? And when you're lying there at rest, can I get some more of this tone back where I don't hit your quad and it looks like I can bounce quarters off of it, which 
ironically, two of the well, they were female athletes at the time. They were mad that they didn't look as good in their static postures, but their CrossFit times all went up and they were mad at me. That's and I'm cool. like, okay, but even because you wanted more performance, they're like, oh, but my abs don't look as defined when I'm like, just contract your abs. And if you want a better picture, yeah, I don't think you want to walk around with that much tension day to day. I don't think anything good's going to come out of it. <laughs> yeah. We had a really good manual therapist at a gym I worked at years back. This was a training think tank when I'd worked with a lot of those top CrossFit Games competitors. And he had made an offhand comment one day that he's like, when you're working with the best CrossFitters, he's like, they are like kittens. Where if you ever see a cat, they could jump really high there fast. Yeah. Poke a cat's muscle bellies. And you're like, oh, it's just like a bag of warm milk. There's yeah. no tension there. And even he was saying some of the CrossFit Games athletes that look really muscular and you'd imagine if, you know, you poke them, it's going to hurt your finger. He's, they have no tension. You could just grab their arm and put it behind their head and twist them in weird ways. And it doesn't. Yeah. I'm like, huh, it's interesting. It makes me wonder if it's almost like a, a survival advantage to get to the top of that sport because they're accruing so, so much less mechanical damage in their day to day life as an athlete when they could be very relaxed versus the athletes who are like the strongest CrossFitters. You typically see that they get to a top level relatively quick, but they never really last for more than one or two seasons. They always end up oh. rolling their backs out. Yeah, they break. Yeah, they tear a peck really easily. And the people at the top of the sport, they're really never the strongest CrossFit competitors, barring maybe on the female side. You often see that like a podium finisher will be the strongest athlete. Sure. There's also a slightly different selection criteria for males and females in yeah. the East right now. Yeah, Justin Kevin, I was talking about that too. Like on some of his top sprinters and athletes, he's like, I, he's like, you can tell right away by just the tissue quality and then watching them move. And then back to what we're talking about with blood flow, my hypothesis is maybe those top CrossFit athletes, maybe it was Todd, maybe it was intrinsic. Who knows? Maybe it's from bazillions of reps if their brain figured it out. But again, if you can get that muscle to relax faster, especially in something like CrossFit, that's a more Medcon based sport then you can get oxygen back. You can get blood flow back to the tissue. And that would probably confer you a big advantage, especially in longer events where the more oxygen you can get to that tissue, the more it turns into this endurance grind to finish it. Yeah. And that makes a lot of sense to me. I also remember at one point, again, working at training thing tank, we had about like 10 top male CrossFit games competitors there for a training camp. And one day someone just decided, let's just have them do like a Vertimax, like max height jump test oh nice <laughs> and one of the most hilarious things i won't throw anyone under the bus but this was a guy who was a podium games finisher the year before was it terrible so <laughs> i'll explain what the form looked like and then you tell me if you think it was <laughs> squatted all the way down to the oh, ground no. and then jumped up <laughs> maybe got three and a half inches off the floor <laughs> what is going on there? Like he just couldn't find a spot of tension in order to explode up where a few of the other guys there, I'd say more of like back of the pack games competitors, obviously exceptionally fit people, but for oh, totally. Walking, there's a difference between being top five at the games and being in 25th place. Yeah. These guys were jumping incredibly high, but they were also, again, much stronger athletes back at the pack. And they made it one or two seasons at that level before eventually getting injured. So even there, you're seeing some of these kind of like loose correlations of oh, people that aren't super explosive, can't really find a spot to generate maximal tension, tend to make it. I mean, that athlete has probably been competing at a top level for maybe eight to 10 years now. Yeah, that's a long time across it. Yeah, very long time for that sport. The really powerful, super explosive guys, again, one to three year careers, unless they could occasionally figure out a way to reverse that and oftentimes that's like a two to three year process of not competing and starting from square one to be able to build back again yeah and that matches it's a another buddy of mine who's a coach he's worked with college athletes and a lot of pros in the nhl and he was telling me that he's like, yeah you get some of these he calls them the sympathetic monsters who come into the nhl and just dominate for one or two years and then literally are gone and nobody ever hears from them again mm -hmm. and he's most of the time they just get injured burnt out whatever he's like the guys who can play five eight sometimes ten years a decade or longer at a high level these they're on when they need to be on and they are completely off when they need to be off 
because I was doing work on one of the athletes over at his place. And it was some pretty intense hands-on work. We're doing some dolphins, some stim stuff on them. The guy like falls asleep on the table as we're working on him, which almost never happens. Yeah. But the second you had him do a task, we had him do some visual tracking stuff. We're like, okay, we want you to do this drill. We explained what it was. Like he was 100%, looked like he went from taking a nap to 100% on and like just destroyed the task. Like we could only get his eyes to make one error and we went back to do it again and he had subconsciously corrected the movement pattern. Wow. So I looked at a buddy of mine, I'm like, did you see that? He's like, holy shit. And we yeah. asked him, we were like, do you know what you just, he's like, no, he had no idea. Yeah. His brain figured out he made an error. And by the time we did the second pass, he had already subconsciously corrected it. Wow. So to me, it's just fascinating how you've got ability to make transitions, but yet that skill or that idea, at least in the U S isn't really taught to athletes. It's like performance at all costs. And then we'll worry about the cost later. And I wonder how much of it is trainable in the person. I don't know. I wonder if everyone was taught that, would you still see it shake out the same way anyway? Right. I'd imagine some more people would probably be performing in that way, but I wonder if that is something that's trainable. It's, it's hard to give it heads or tails either way right now. Yeah. We've done some stuff with RPR, reflexive performance reset, and at least in terms of tools, that seems to be the best thing I found for it. But yeah, and again, it even goes back to training. Did they just subconsciously figure it out? Were they taught that? Yeah. Cool. Well, as we wrap up, like, what is the use of the device for people looking? Because we started looking at, okay, we can maybe individualize training now. Like, how would people use this device? How do they put it on? And what would be some of the data that's useful for them to change their training? Yeah, t totally. So it's an end-to-end -end solution to the device. You put it on like a lot of other wearables. It comes with a, like a universal strap that you could put on like a quadricep, upper limb. What we, we tell people is if you have more of an unconventional use for it, you want to put on a lateral delt or a lad, you could use an adhesive for that. So it's pretty small, right? For listeners, like how big is yeah. it? Yeah, so it's about a thumb size. So if you... Oh, it's tiny. Yeah, not ginormous hands. I'm not a huge guy, so <laughs> the size of my thumb. So it's a pretty small device, like a USB stick size. So you could put it on most muscles and it's an end to end solution. So when you use it, it streams all of the data to a mobile phone in live time. So if you're working out, you could see your active nitric oxide levels and your muscle oxygen consumption and your muscle oxygenation. So you can and, see that live on your phone and just yeah, Bluetooth on, I assume. Yep, exactly. And cool. what we tell people is that's one way to use it and interact with it. If you know exactly what you want from the data and you could make adjustments on the fly, have at it. After you finish a workout, press end workout on your phone. If you're called Knox One Elite user, it's a second tier up. All of that data automatically comes into a platform online. It's a pretty robust analysis platform. So you could get your workout view and you could comb through the data, combine any of the biomarker measurements. You could compare that data to other workouts that you've done. You could see your trends over time. So we've added a lot of features in there, essentially thinking what things might the coach want to do with this platform? And then we build it in because it is a subscription model. We're able to continually add new features in there. What I will say is just in the mobile app itself, there is another feature in there as well. We call it the AI coach. This is probably less for the high performance users and more for maybe someone that's, I want to increase my active nitric oxide levels. I know nothing about training or sure whatsoever. So the way that this works is you strap the device on, you say what modality you want to do, picking between cyclic options. So I want to bike, run, elliptical, row, you name it. Tell us how long you want to work out and press go. And what the AI coach does is it reads your biomarker levels in real time and it guides you through a workout. So it's like having a mm. coach there telling you go faster, go slower, that type of thing. But it's making those adjustments based on your own biomarker levels. So what it tries to do for that workout period, whatever time you select, is it's going to alternate between higher and lower intensity bouts, knowing that the high exertions are what are going to cause the most active nitric oxide release in the tissue. But you can't just crush yourself with high intensity. Right. You will essentially deplete your snow in that tissue. You, you can't do that all the time, man. That's not what the internet told me. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and shoot 20 Tabatas in a row and right. you know, perfect every day. So essentially what it's trying to do is it's trying to balance that intensity and recovery with whatever period that you exercise for and it's making adjustments in real time 
So there's different ways of interacting with both the mobile app and the online platform. And then we have another tier of offerings, which is really only for like sports teams and military. And that's a team specific platform that has more features in there. And it's more geared for the types of analysis that you would want to do if you had a crew of 30 people and you were wanting to look at all of their data and compare things like that. Cool. And what is the rough price point? So the device itself is $300 USD and the subscriptions range from 20 to $60 a month for people. Teams have their own custom price points. That's a sure. buyer to you or coach for a professional sports team. And that's going to depend on like customizations and features and things like that. Awesome. And could people put more than one sensor on if they wanted to get crazy then, or is it just one sensor right now? So for right now, it's just one. So someone wanted to buy a device. When you buy a device right now, you buy it with a subscription. And that's because right now the mobile app only allows you to sync one device. A few months after launch, we're going to remove that constraint. And Knox One Elite users will be able to sync multiple devices to a single phone. Oh, nice. Point, people will just be able to go on the website and buy a device without it being associated with a subscription. Very cool. Awesome. And have you noticed any of the supplements to increase blood flow? Do they do anything? What I'll say is in my... <laughs> you don't have to name brands, but... <laughs> yeah, in my limited experience looking at this, I have not seen that any of those supplements impact your active nitric oxide levels in any way. That said, N of 1, probably not high enough doses in many cases. Also not knowing exactly what is in a lot of these supplements because yeah. they're very ingredients, so... It's quite possible the right combination of ingredients and correct doses for the correct person will have an effect, but it stands to tell. But someone could do their own experiments now, right? Because they've actually got an active endpoint instead of, I don't know, bro, I felt like I got a better pump. <laughs> exactly. And this is where the interesting thing is even trying to figure out what would be the time scale that we would see these effects, because knowing that when you take a beetroot supplement, it increases the plasma nitrate concentrations, which in theory right. would end up increasing nitric oxide, but that's increasing ordinary nitric oxide, which still needs to be metabolized and turned into active nitric oxide. So I don't know what the time scales look like from when you're ingesting something like a beetroot supplement. When does that actual beetroot that you ingested end up getting converted into nitrate to nitric oxide to active nitric oxide? I actually don't know the answer to that, but I suspect it's not within that session. So there might even be something to like continuous dosing, things like that. So there's going to be a lot to experiment with. I think that's part of the fun of it as well. That's something I really loved about the Moxie community for years is it's just people trying things out and talking about what they see. Yeah. And if people are using nitrates, don't use mouthwash because it will kill the enzyme that you need to con convert it. So just... To there, I just saved you $30 on your beetroot supplements or whatever. <laughs> yeah, no, either Listerine, either. And completely off topic, but I think you like some good metal music. Is that correct? Do they hear the rumors correct? Like myself, some hardcore music. Any top favorites? Ooh, I, I do change this a lot, but right now I've been listening to a lot of Norma Jean, which is... 2000s and yeah, American hardcore bands. That's definitely one of my favorites. I always come back to them. Any other favorites? I know you were an August Burns Red fan, am I right? Oh, I love August Burns Red. Yeah. Directly, yeah, I always do some August Burns Red. Been listening to a lot of post hardcore, like Glass Johns and bands like that from <laughs> 2000s. So I have a cut off anything that comes after 2008 to 10. <laughs> Heard it. The only newer hardcore band that I've gotten really into in recent years is Knocked Loose. Yeah, they're pretty good. Yeah, I do like their music a lot. It has a very old school feel. Yeah. Yeah, there's another Texas band called Kubla Khan that's metal, hardcore. The first couple of times I heard it, I was like, I don't know. And then I heard it the other day, I was like, whoa, this is actually really good. <laughs> I actually saw them. It was a club in Atlanta a few years ago. Oh, did I, you? Yeah, they opened for Norma Jean on a tour. Oh, wow. It's a pretty cool show because that was like a hometown show for Norma Jean. Um, another nice. more one, Silent Plan, that I like a lot. It's some more vibes like a Kublai Khan or a Knock Loose. Nice. And then uh, Early Haste the Day is also very good in that kind that, of genre. That's great. Yeah. Awesome. 
And so where can people find more about the device? Where should they go? Best website. And then if you want to be found anywhere, I know you've got some good stuff on your Instagram all the time too. Yes. So find the device. The company is called Knox. So it's N-O-X, just Knox.com, Knox1.com. You could also just Google Knox. <laughs> I think if you Google it, the only other thing that comes up is there's someone that plays World of Warcraft and their name is Knox. <laughs> I know that person too. And that's uh, fine what I'm doing. Just Google my name, Evan Pycon. There's only one of me in the world, so I'm pretty easy to track down. Awesome. Thank you so much for all your time and really appreciate it. And I think the device will be super interesting for people to run their own experiments too. Because as we talked about, it's good, I think, to understand the principles of how stuff works. And then the next level down is how can you get some of your own data to to look at it and see what's actually going on, which can allow you to be more efficient and have better outcomes then too. Yeah, absolutely. And thanks for having me on. This is great. Yeah, no problem. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you so much for listening to the podcast here. Really appreciate it. Huge thanks to Evan for coming on the podcast here once again. Always enjoy talking to him. Always learn something new. Make sure to check out the Knox device. You can go to noxx.com. I don't have any disclosures with them, but I've known Evan for a while. I've followed his stuff, been able to chat with him many times. And like I said, I always learn something new about physiology. And so I wanted to have him on here and support him in his new endeavor. And it looks super interesting. So I'm excited to check it out myself. So make sure to check out his stuff there. And if you enjoy this geeky chat, check out my newsletter. You can get it at MikeTNelson.com. It's free and it goes right to your inbox. We've got all sorts of snippets on how to increase muscle, better your performance, improve body composition, and do it all without destroying your health in the process. So go to MikeTNelson.com. Again, big thanks to Evan. Make sure to check out all the links and everything from him below. And if you do pick up one of the devices and you're using it, let me know how it goes. I'm pretty excited to check it out myself. And as always, if you can leave us a short review or whatever stars you feel is appropriate, pass this along to someone you think may enjoy it. Really appreciate that. That really helps the podcast and helps uh, get better distribution with the old algorithms so that more people can be better overall. Thanks to Evan. Thank you for listening. I really appreciate it. I'll talk to all of you next week.